so what we're going to be talking about today is the many feminisms of post-war America. And I titled this lecture the way that I do is because second wave feminism, like the civil rights movement that we just discussed, had various approaches. And what we're going to do in this class is basically break it down into two differing approaches. First of all, you're going to have something known as liberal feminism. And secondly, you're going to have something known as radical feminism. Now, as I was describing this slide, this introduction to the lecture, I use the term second wave feminism. And just so there's no confusion, I want to explain briefly this period here in the 1950s and more specifically the 1960s and 1970s is known as second wave feminism because the first wave of feminism, of course, took place during the early 20th century that culminated in the amendment giving women the right to vote. So what we're going to do here is we're going to pick up this story now after skipping over it for the past several decades, picking up the story after World War II to see the situation that women were in, particularly economically, but also socially in the United States in this post-World War II era. Now, when we talk about these two different groups that I referred to in the introduction to this lecture, the liberal feminists and the radical feminists, an easy way to understand this debate is by looking at the question of what is the root of women's oppression. And in order to do that, we're gonna start out by looking at two images that give us an idea of what the liberal feminists were all about and what the radical feminists were all about. Looking at this image, we can see a couple things. First of all, looking at the signs, we can see that this seems to be about uh, women's economic experiences in the workplace. So for instance, one of them is talking about women conductors demanding uh, driving promotions, sick pay, and pensions. Uh, we refuse to be second class workers. So clearly what this protest is by looking at this image, we don't know the specifics, but we can get an idea that this is about these women fighting for equality in the workplace. And the women too, we can tell a little bit about them. They seem to be a professional class of women. We can see perhaps that they're at least middle age, if not older. And we can see here their means of protest is pretty conservative. They look to be in a sort of more upper class surroundings that might be perhaps a government building. Uh, but regardless, what are they doing? They're seeking donations, it seems. They're holding up their little cans and their buckets to receive donations to help them fight for this cause. So this image right here encapsulates the ideas undergirding this liberal feminism, which is all about achieving economic equality between men and women in the workplace. This image is entirely different. This image, we do know a more prominent and famous event uh, we're going to be talking about later in lecture today, and that is the protest against the Miss America pageant in Atlantic City in 1968. But even if we didn't know that, we could see some differences in this image. So first of all, let's look at the signs, just as we did with the previous images, and we can get an idea about what these women were fighting for. Let's judge ourselves as people, can make up cover the wounds of our oppression. Let's judge ourselves as people further back, and then finally way back in the, in the, the, the background of the image, everybody is beautiful. So clearly these women are talking less about economic issues and more about a tendency in American life in the 1960s and beyond to treat women as objects, to treat them as sex objects, to be very clear here. But beyond that issue, we see something else. First of all, the protesters themselves. These women look to be younger. And look at what they're wearing compared to what the women in the previous image are wearing. Here we have women um, in more kind of done up hair. They're in mini skirts, which pick up in, 19, in popularity in the 1960s. They look different. But we also see behind the women. We see behind them a do not cross police line. Uh, 
we see a police officer behind that do not cross police line. So these women seem more sinister, more dangerous, that this protest requires police presence, whereas that last protest, at least what we could see in the image, did not. And more so, interestingly enough, we see a clear divide. Over on this side of the line, a lot of men, the police officers and beyond them, and on this side, we see a lot of women. So there's clearly a division between male and female in this image. So what we're seeing with these radical feminists is less a concern about economic equality and more of a concern about what is taking place in the bedroom, in society where women are treated as sex objects for the male gaze during this period. As a result of these different approaches, we see some disagreements spring up. Now, Betty Friedan, who we read for this week in one of the documents, the most famous document probably to come out of this era, The Feminine Mystique, Betty Friedan was a liberal feminist, and she was oftentimes very critical of the approach of radical feminists. And we can see this in her memoirs, published later, several decades later, It Changed My Life. And I wanna just read a couple of these quotes to really get at the divide here. One of the things she said was the following. I didn't think a thousand vibrators would make much different or that it mattered who was in the missionary position if unequal power positions in real life weren't changed. It was the economic imbalance, the power imbalance in the world that subverted sex or made sex itself into a power game where no one could win. Here we see again this issue saying, Betty Friedan saying, it's economics stupid essentially. That is where the problem is centralized, the root of women's oppression, if you will. To go back to the question we asked at the beginning of this lecture, it's all in economics, and that then kind of trickles down to sexual relations and societal relations between men and women. Well, later in the book, she would add, I feel like a grim spoil sport sometimes, always insisting to my sisters in a movement on that dull economic basis that had to change for any woman to be able to enjoy her own sexuality or to truly love anyone. It was so much easier and more fun just to talk about sex, vibrators, women, men, underneath or on top. But to extrapolate sexual joylessness and lonely need, masochism or cruelty as a permanent condition of women is in my opinion to give up the battle. Again, we see a sort of dig at these women, these radical feminists who are seeking to talk about unequal relations in a bedroom. Betty Friedan is saying all of that is just for the media to kind of garner attention. She's saying again, it's all about economics and that's what women, that's what feminists should be focusing on. So I wanna start by talking about liberal feminism and to do so we're gonna talk about the existence of women in the workplace in the 1940s and 1950s. As we can see on the slide here, by 1945, 19.3 million women were working outside the home. The following year, so right after, a year after World War II, by early 1946, 2.25 million women would voluntarily leave their jobs, while another 1 million were laid off by their employers. Even with these numbers, by 1950, 29% of women still worked outside the home, mostly as a means to earn extra income to afford for all of the things in their suburban lifestyle that we talked about in previous classes. So in short, even in 1950, as a lot of people were viewing women as suburban housewives, almost a third of all women were working outside the home in the modern workforce. But it was not looked highly upon. And not only was it not looked highly upon, women were really relegated to the least important jobs. So for instance, as secretarial work, teaching or cleaning. And those women, those one third of women who were working outside of the home, moreover, were often looked down upon by prominent communists. We see the discouragement that women who wanted to work outside of the home faced by looking at a, a text that was published in 1947 by Ferdinand Lundberg, a male sociologist, and his female co-author, a psychoanalyst by the name of Marinia Farnham. And this book was known as Modern Women, The Lost Sex, and it was published in 1947. 
and it essentially denounced career women. We can see some of the quotes on the screen. The independent woman is a contradiction in terms, according to the authors. Uh, women could not be independent, in other words. They had to rely on a male to provide them with basic sustenance. Furthermore, women, the authors argue, needed to strive for, quote, receptivity and passiveness, a willingness to accept dependence without fear or resentment, with a deep inwardness and readiness for the final goal of sexual life, impregnation. Here again, women should be docile. They should allow the man to control everything, and their only concern should be for their final goal becoming pregnant and bearing children to start a family. Well, according to the authors, to reject such ambitions, the authors claimed, meant that women were, in their words, sick, unhappy, neurotic, wholly or partly incapable of dealing with life. This is something that we'll see in a lot of the literature, and I believe in the segment that we're going to read from Betty Friedan this week, that even she brings up this psychological attack on women who seek to go outside the home. They are deemed mentally unstable. Um, this mental instability kind of colors them as oddballs and out of the norm in 1940s and 1950s America. Not surprisingly, these attitudes also affected women's ability to obtain education in the 1940s and 1950s. So it was common for women to be married from the time they were 19, and most brides were pregnant within seven months of being married at age 19. In fact, from 1940 to 1960, during the period of the so-called baby boom, the number of families with three children would double, and the number of families having a fourth child would quadruple. So these numbers are to say that if women were getting married by the time they were 19, becoming pregnant within seven months, and then having two, three, four children, they're likely not going to have time for education. But nonetheless, some women were able to get become educated. And we see this in the numbers that I have at the top of this slide. Now, first of all, men. Men were greatly benefited by the GI Bill that was passed after World War II that allowed them to go to school for free. And therefore, we will see in 1950, there will be about 1.56 million men. Well, the number of women enrolled in college in 1950 was about half that at 721,000 women. But more important than those numbers are the graduation rates for men versus women whereas about 55% of all males graduated in 1950, about 37% of women did. Why is there such a discrepancy between male and female graduation rates here in 1950? Well, it had to do with why women went to college. Many people joked in the 1950s that women would drop out of college to obtain their MRS degree, their Mrs. degree and to work on their PhD, which meant putting hubby through. Women's colleges, therefore, encouraged their students to stay away from the so-called serious subjects. If their only purpose of going to college was to get a husband, they didn't need to study economics, physics, science, and all those other significant and important subjects. Rather, they could focus on degrees dealing with ceramics, weaving, and floral arrangements. One college president, this is the guy at the top of the university, went so far as to say the following. This is a quote that we see on the screen. The college years must be a rehearsal period for the major performance. What was that major performance? It was to become married. So again, women were supposed to go to college to find a husband, and that was the main goal. Well, one of the women who attended college was an individual by the name of Betty Goldstein. Betty Goldstein majored in psychology at Smith College. Smith College was a private women's college in Massachusetts. Well, following graduation in 1942, she worked as a labor, labor journalist and briefly attended the University of California at Berkeley as a psychology graduate student. Now, as she told the story later on in life, Betty Goldstein would actually be encouraged by her then boyfriend and pressured to leave this graduate program at Berkeley. Uh, 
She did so, and eventually, five years or five years, a little less than five years later, in 1947, she would marry Carl Friedan, an advertising executive, and they would have three children, and eventually they would become divorced in 1969. But nonetheless, this woman I've been talking about, obviously, if, if, if you haven't gotten it by now, is Betty Friedan. Well, in 1957, Betty Friedan returned to Smith College for her class reunion, her 15th anniversary class reunion. And it was during this class reunion that she conducted a survey of all of her fellow female graduates about their education, about their jobs, and their family life. Well, it was through this survey that she discovered the phrase, the problem that has no name. Mainly, she found this dissatisfaction prevalent among suburban housewives that they felt, but they could not fully articulate. Besides writing The Feminine Mystique in 1963, Betty Friedan was also known for her leading efforts in creating the National Organization for Women. So I want to talk about how these events came about in the mid-1960s. And to begin this story, we're going to look back to 1961. In 1961, President Kennedy signed an executive order that created a presidential commission on the status of women. Eleanor Roosevelt, the wife of Franklin Roosevelt, would serve as its chair. Well, the commission report was issued in 1963, and this commission report was entitled American Women. And what the report did was it expressed concern that women face certain inequalities but it still held the view of women as belonging to a particular case. And therefore, when I'm talking about case, C-A-S-T-E, and therefore as a particular case, they were sort of circumscribed as what they were able to do, even in this report by the Presidential Commission on the Status of Women. In short, there was a glass ceiling present in this report. Well, in 1966, the third national conference of state commissions on the status of women was held. The participants of this third national conference of state commissions on the status of women, uh, they were informed that they could not pass resolutions over an issue that concerned them greatly. And that issue that concerned them greatly was the lack of enforcement of sexual discrimination laws by the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. Now this Equal Employment Opportunity Commission was what was created as part of Title VII of the 1964 Civil Rights Act, which if you remember from our last lecture, was related to this idea that everyone, regardless of their race, their creed, their color, or their sex, should be guaranteed equality in the workplace. Well, angered that they could not pass resolutions regarding the failure of the EEOC, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, to protect women in the workplace, 28 women, including Betty Friedan, walked out and formed the National Organization for Women to act as a pressure group and demand laws for women's rights, particularly in the workplace. Now, you see in their statement of purposes that you're reading for this class, this discussion about relationship between men and women. And I really want you to pay attention to how the National Organization for Women treats men. Are they anti-men? Are they pro-men? Do they see men as victims? And I want you to contrast this with some of the documents that we're gonna talk about with radical feminists later on in the class. By the late 1960s, radical feminism, with its focus on the unequal private relations between men and women as the root of women's oppression, forced liberal feminists like Betty Friedan to move beyond economic arguments focused on women's acceptance in the public sphere. So what we see here in short, whereas liberal feminism was all about the public sphere, the workplace, radical feminism would move the lens of the camera to the private sphere in relations between men and women. And as a result, you'd see a new phrase springing up among these radical feminists, and that is the personal is political, becoming the slogan of these radical feminists, meaning that just because something took place in your own home, in your own personal relationship, didn't mean that it didn't have 
political ramifications for women in society. So this is when you're going to see during this time the growth of something known as consciousness raising. And consciousness raising was that the belief that in talking about their personal experiences in a group, women would come to understand that what they had previously thought were only personal problems unique to themselves were in fact social and political issues that required drastic changes in the political realm. Radical feminism, if we want to look for its origins, had its origins in women's experiences in the social activism of the 1960s, whether in the civil rights movement or the anti-war movement. And in particular, I want to focus on one event in June 1967 that really showcases the problems that women were facing in these supposedly equal and non-hierarchical organizations in the civil rights and anti-war movements. So in June of 1967, Students for a Democratic Society, SDS, was a phenomenally successful activist organization that attracted a lot of young college students. Well, they would hold its annual convention in June of 1967. During this convention, women succeeded in getting a resolution regarding women's rights passed. And one of the portions of this resolution said the following that we see up on the screen here. People who identify with the movement and feel that their own lives are part of the base to bring about radical social change must recognize the necessity for the liberation of women. Our brothers must recognize that because they were brought up in the United States, they cannot be free of the burden of male chauvinism. So basically, women of the new left, as this, these groups were known as during this time in the 1960s, were telling their male colleagues in SDS and in the civil rights movement that you need to basically look at yourselves and change the way you treat women in the civil rights and the anti-war movement. Women are more than sex objects. Women are more than um, worthy of cleaning the dishes. Women are more than just the ones to kind of look pretty for the movement. They actually have a role to play in the civil rights and anti-war movement. Well, here's the thing. When the resolution by these women was published in SDS's New Left Notes the following week, it was printed next to a girl, and this is the image that we see on the right, it was printed next to a girl with earrings, a polka dot mini dress, and matching underwear that were showing, clearly a signal that the males in SDS did not take these plans and these demands seriously. Otherwise, they would put a woman that was not, if you will, all dolled up to look like a kind of airhead without any intelligence, and it was all just about looks. Well, if this wasn't enough for women to say there's a problem in groups like SDS, another event two years later, it became a lot clearer that there were a lot of problems in the student movement. And this event was an event to protest Richard Nixon's inauguration. It was known as the 1969 Counter Inaugural. Now, during this Counter Inaugural, which was an anti war protest in Washington, D.C., here in January 1969, Marilyn Seltzman Webb. Now, Marilyn Seltzman Webb was married to a guy, Lee Webb. Lee Webb was actually one of the founders of SDS. And Marilyn Seltzman Webb would give a speech during this counter inaugural in Washington, D.C. in 1969. And she said the following. This is a direct quote from this speech. We as women are oppressed. We as women who are supposedly the most privileged in this society are mutilated as human beings so that we will learn to function within the capitalist system. When Marilyn Seltzman Webb was on the stage, men in the crowd started fighting with women in the crowd who believed that the men were not taking this issue seriously enough. Men started to yell things like, take her off the stage, rape her in the back alley, take it off in reference to the clothing that these women were wearing. So this really was a stab in the heart for a lot of these women who thought the men who worked in the anti-war and the civil rights movement were fighting for the same things. Well, in fact, as it turned out, these men in the civil rights and anti-war movements were no different than the men in general, in society in general. One of the most famous protests carried out by this women's liberation movement 
and these radical feminists was in Atlantic City in August of 1968 when you ha had the Miss America protest pageant. Now this protest was led by a group known as the New York Radical Women, one of the earliest women's liberation groups in America. Approximately 150 feminists from across the country took part in this protest. The general argument against the pageant was that it focused too much attention on physical attributes and made women feel inferior because they could not measure up to the standards of these pageant contestants. Well, at the Miss America protest, and you can see some of these images on the screen here, women refused to talk to male journalists. And as a result, this forced many news outlets to look for women reporters who were usually relegated to soft news about celebrities and the wealthy society. Women also chained, them, chained themselves to a Miss America doll to emphasize women's enslavement to what these protesters called beauty standards. Protesters also filled, most famously, a freedom trash can with objects that were viewed as torturing women. So these included things like girdles, bras, hair curlers, and issues of Ladies Home Journal, as well as Playboy magazine. Male reporters, again, were not given interviews. They were not allowed to photograph it. They were kept far away from all of these proceedings. Now, interestingly enough, although the press would label the protesters bra burners and this label would stay attached to them, the items were never set on fire because the Atlantic City Police refused to allow it, fearing that it would set the boardwalk on fire. But nonetheless, there are other unique protests taking place during this action. One protester dressed as a stockbroker and auctioned off an effigy of Miss America. While auctioning the effigy off, the stockbroker yelled the following, Gentlemen, I offer you the 1969 model. She's better every year. She walks, she talks, she smiles on cue, and she does housework. So what we see here is this effort to say that women are being treated as objects and they're forced to conform to this certain image. So therefore they're, they're gonna do their hair up in a certain way. They're gonna wear these body conforming items to make them stay fit and trim, whether it be bras, whether it be girdles, they want freedom from all of this. And therefore we can see in the middle image of this slide, women feel like cattle being trotted up on stage and basically being auctioned off to the highest purchase. But also we see a sort of dig at the female participants of this Miss America pageant. We can see here the image on the far left, I am a woman, not a toy, pet, or mascot. And as we can see, they crowned a sheep as Miss America. So this is sort of a dig at these women who participate in the Miss America pageant saying they are no different than sheep for willing to put their bodies out there for the men to oogle at and paw at and all those kind of things. Well, beyond the protests that were taking place outside on the boardwalk in Atlantic City, 16 of the protesters bought tickets to attend the pageant. When the outgoing Miss America read her farewell address, a large banner was dropped that read the following, women's liberation. Moreover, so this was now across all the airwaves, it was picked up on camera. Now everybody was introduced to this idea of women's liberation. The women also shouted things like freedom for women and no more Miss America. Five of the women were arrested after they let off a smoke bomb. So clearly we see this Miss America protest pageant as being entirely different from these more boring demands made of equality in the workplace. Now women are saying, we needed to be treated as equals and as such this again goes from the kitchen to society all the way to the bedroom as you see in the myth of the vaginal orgasm document that it's so important to see with that document though again this idea that the personal is political how does that document the myth of the vaginal orgasm tie in what is going on in the bedroom to the societal differences between men and women in terms of power and the relations between them.